Kia ora tātou. Uh, me wahi ki tō tātou Matarui te rangi, te whare tū nei e papa ke waho nei nō reira tēnā kurua. Uh, ki o tātou tēne mate, haere, haere, haere ki te pō, i nā huna ora, i te warutau tēne whare, ko tai mai nei tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. For those of you who have no idea what I just said, it goes like this. To the spirit in the sky, greetings. To the building we stand in, to the land beneath us, greetings. To those who have been before, we farewell you. To you, the living people in the building, greetings to you all. Pretty simple, right? But it's all about language. Um, my name's Steve Renata, and representing the Kiwa Digital team, um, some of us are up in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai, some of us are in Melbourne today, and there's a whole bunch of us in Auckland, so I got the lucky job to come down here, so thank you for coming. I figured at about 2.30, having done one or two presentations in my life and sat through a few, this is about video fest time. So a little less talking from me and a whole lot of action. Um, on a serious note, what I wanted to try and do was to bring the language of the people into the room. So that's part of the reason why we've got lots of videos of people speaking their native tongue. Many of it you won't know, but I think you'll get the gist of the power of it. So with that said, uh, world of languages. For those of you who are statistically minded, there's about 7,000 languages around the world, depending on which research you're reading. That's a lot. Um, if we're English speaking, we might think that's the biggest language. Actually, we're about a third of Mandarin, which is the biggest, at about 825 million. We're way down in the 300s. If you try to figure out, so of those 7,000 languages, we split them up by the world's population, it should be about a million people per language. Actually, it's the inverse. And what we see by this, what's called Eggert's language scale, uh, which is one uh, particular measurement approach to work out the um, endangerment, if you like, of language. What you essentially see is that down the bottom left-hand corner, 85 of the 7,000 languages are spoken by almost 80% of the population. So you've got a, just a couple of languages being spoken by a whole lot of people and a whole lot of language hardly spoken by anybody. But it gets even scarier. We also know that when we talk about culture, Actually, when you associate the two words, language and culture, how does it work? One way of, of thinking of this, or a filter that we apply, is language is a DNA strand of culture. It's not the being end of culture, but it's a very important part, a DNA strand. What about language death? You've got 7,000 languages. How are we doing on that? In two weeks' time, 14 days, one of those languages will be gone forever. So while there's a lot, we're losing them very quickly. Two weeks, that's my daughter's school holidays, and a language is lost somewhere in the world. So that's why it's important. How, how do we consider that? I'm not saying stop it, but how do we consider that? It's like a tsunami, and you're going to try and stop it by blowing back at it. We think it's about language life, and the preservation, the revitalization of language through technology be one of the most important social consequences in our time. However, technology alone will not save languages. You need passion, you need pride. It has to start at home. Even if we do a good job at school, even if we do a good job in this convention, that's not what's going to change it. It has to actually get back into the home because if it's not spoken in the home, the language very quickly dies. So digital technology gives us a chance to cross some of those thresholds that have been there for years. It breaks through walls. It goes from school and it goes into the bedroom of the child. It goes into the kitchen where the mother's cooking. It goes across countries. And, when, and if we don't do that, then the language becomes, as the Aboriginals would say, it goes silent. The Aborigines don't believe it dies, it's just silent. But for how long? So Kiwa Digital, what's our involvement in this? Well, we're passionate about revitalisation and preservation. And that big long sentence there gives you some idea of what we're trying to do. At our core, we are a digital publishing company. And someone says, Steve, what do you do? We build apps, digital book apps. That's what we do. Which, depending on your perspective, could be quite a clinically dry, is that really going to change the world perspective? Actually, we think we can. And it's the software code inside the apps. And those of you that are thinking gaming, that's not us. 
the literacy functionality, the what we call swipe to read, touch to listen to a word, double tip to hear it spell, is what we've focused on, which is digitally mimicking, for those of you that are um, teachers of language, the neurological impress method. So this is a method of shared reading. I sit with my daughter Grace, I put my finger on the text, and we read together. I read slightly louder, slightly faster. She's getting a neurological impress of my voice in her ear as she speaks. This technique has been proven to accelerate reading levels by three or four levels over a six to 12 week period. If used three to five minutes a day, a few days a week over a period. What we've done at Kiwa is taken that concept and digitally mimicked it in the software code. So while we have what's called audio books, actually it's a lot more than that. Very subtle to the eye, but when you actually experience it, you start to see transformation and increased literacy levels. On our journey, we've, we've spent quite a lot of time what we'd call repurposing people's work, books, children's books, etc., Māori legends, myths. But we've also found that one of the really powerful ways to engage the community at all, at all age groups is to actually have them come in and write the stories themselves. And so we came up with a process called the Kiwa Slam Workshop. We stole the idea from the film industry. Those of you that have anything to do with film or a, a liking for that, there's a competition that runs globally, nationally and regionally, called the 48 Hour Film Festival. You get together and you make a film in 48 hours. Trust me, a lot of work. A lot of work, great passion, but a huge amount of work. So we borrowed that idea and thought, how about if we made a digital app book in 48 hours? And off we went. So here's a little bit about how that actually works. The Kiwa Slam program has been designed to work with partners to create transformative experiences. So we um, let um, imagination run wild, like just let all the ideas pop in your head. It was epic fun. <laughs> Delivered over two days, it allows team members to capture their stories in a world-class digital book. It isn't just writing a story, um, there's all these different facets that, that, that come in that they get exposed to. The first day is around figuring out their own identities as individuals and then how they're going to fit and work together as a team. So we create an environment that makes it very safe and gives a lot of freedom and a lot of scope to move around and test out ideas. Day two is focused on creating illustrations, typing, printing the story, scanning the pages and producing a voiceover. But then being able to take those assets and put them into a really uh, 21st century digital format is where you get the cool factor. The ability for the team members to have their stories up on the App Store means they are internationally published authors. Suddenly you're global. You see how their, their friends and their family are reacting to them as well, because that sense of pride that their, their children have been able to deliver this amazing work. I'm very proud of them. The results really do speak for themselves. But there's more. Um, we worked on this project with the Ministry of Education, uh, looking at five key competencies. I just wanted to focus on one relevant to this particular session, which is around language. And um, this is what the experts say about the language aspect, let me just roll this for the direction. To the average New Zealand child now, technology is just part of their daily living. It's about developing greater control over those things and knowing when to use them appropriately, but also when they're combined with language symbols and text, 
you can have a very powerful message very simply. This is a new experience. I've never done anything like this before. But I didn't even know they had digital books. What's been interesting is now they've got the words, they've got to go, what do I need to see in that picture? Go, what do I need to cover? And it's almost like the pictures can either support the words or it can add to it and they can have other elements that we weren't able to have in the story. And so it's realising the power of using symbols, texts in different ways conveys a lot more meaning. The size of the writing, the colour, perhaps a little zigzag thing around it gives greater emphasis. Yeah, there are some unique pieces of slang and it's really interesting to see the evolution of language um, come through colloquialisms and even other languages. You know, it increased my confidence a lot to see, see my mum. I read a book in Psalm 1 because um, I'm showing my mum's heritage. She'll be really proud, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of letting them go, what do you want to say, you know, with the text that they've created and with the language that they've created? which is their language. Makes me feel like I'm famous already. Yeah. <laughs> so lots of thinking, research, really getting out there and actually doing it with real people, um, but not only in this country, overseas. So while I've shown you that, the reason for that was just showing you the kind of extension in the history of Kiwa. The truth was, we started in Alaska a year earlier. So this, the one that you've just seen was about 14 months old. A year before that, we went to Alaska to work with the Kupik. And again, rather than me rant on about it, this is their story in two minutes. <laughs> For a long time, there's been a movement in Alaska um, to, to preserve and revitalize the indigenous Alaska native languages, and a lot of folks are solidly behind those kinds of efforts, either in general or as part of their educational system at their school. We invited Rhonda Kite, the CEO of Akiwa Digital, to come and speak at the AASB conference. And uh, she did, but she also came with an idea of why don't we produce a book in 48 hours using students and some advisors and we'll turn it around, we'll incorporate some languages in there and, and it will be a way for intergenerations to work together to produce a product. They reacted very positively to it and they, the, I think it was a really good cooperative learning experience for them. We did. We are Alaska on traditional values and how we are as a people and what we do. And my little brothers and sisters like to read that story like every single day. And they press on the words and they copy what they're saying. I think that's kind of cool, like especially since it's for the kids. It feels pretty good passing our, our stories from our elders and from our long time ago ancestors so that we can be able to pass it on from generation to generation. So after the first Q-Book Slam, we were able to travel out to Chibak and share the book with the community. It's really cool to see their excitement and to hear them speak Chupik words as we demonstrated the book. How about sister? The kids who participated in the slam gained instant credibility and were viewed as rock stars. This was the first Q-Book Slam in the whole we traveled to Chivac that same month. They were uh, interested in doing 12 books, uh, so it was easier to actually take them to New Zealand to the recording studio and within a space of a few days get all of the books uh, recorded and then have them constructed after they left. <laughs> So some heartwarming stuff. 
So started in Alaska, kept working on this over the last two years, and now we're working um, with the Aboriginal community. I'm just conscious of time, so as much as I'd love to show you 50 videos, I'll show you just one or two. Here's an example of the same thing done um, with the VACL, the Victorian Aboriginal community over there. These are just 30 seconds of what a, a final product looks like from a slam in the, in the native tongue there. The lonely, this book belongs lonely to seagull. So in all of these books, what I'm showing you is the indigenous native tongue, but there's also the English version in it, so they can flip in and out um, as required. Um, a little bit closer to home, Naitahu. Um, I, I grew up in Dunedin, and even though I'm Napui, I still consider myself part, part uh, Naitahu. And uh, these are one of the iwi in the country that have really got their SHIT together in terms of language revitalisation, and they are investing a lot of resource into it, money, people. And um, we were very gracious to be invited to help them. So the first story for all iwi is the creation story. Those of you that are familiar with some of the Māori creation stories will probably be thinking of Ranganui Papatuanuku, these words might be ringing a bell. However, if you go to Naitahu, we're not talking about those. We're talking about different characters. Their version of how the world was created with people like Paikia and Tahu Portiki. So here's a little snapshot. This has never been shown in the world until today outside of Naitahu. True story. Oh, sorry, let me just go back one there. Te waka o auraki Kai a te pō, te tumatanga mai o te waiatatanga mai o te atua Nā te pō, ko te au, nā te au, ko te au mārama Nā te au mārama, ko te au tūroa, nā te au tūroa, ko te kore te whiwhia Nā te kore te whiwhia, ko te kore te rauea, nā te kore te rauea, ko te kore te tā māu Interesting enough, we really spent a lot of time laboring over making this story perfect for them based off an original video. And we had a lot of elders involved, a lot of older people. And then something really bizarre happened. We went down and did a slam with Kaitahu, which is essentially the bottom half of the South Island, who don't want to call himself Naitahu. It's a dialectic thing. We did the on the marae there at Otaputi, Otako Marae, and we did a two-day slam. This time we brought in Komatua, mums and dads, and children. And they came up with a four, a four chapter story which looks like this. One section of it, that is. Kai tahu, kai raro i te tui a little o te bird kaka. told me, is the translation. Te tātai heke o kai tahu. Hei tā te tahi taua no te wai ponamu ki tāhana mokopuna. Nā rā kai hotu ka roto o te wai ponamu i kari. Koia te kai hotu o te waka uruao. Now one of the interesting findings was we had an original myth legend that everybody was sort of dying over. We put all the work into it, did it professionally. We went and did a more human, realistic, make your own story. When we asked the kids, what do you like the most? Guess what the response was? First of all, the younger children want to hear a female voice. Hello, you'd think you'd get that, wouldn't you? So that was big learning. Younger children, ECE, make sure it's a female voice because they, they're responding to what naturally probably happens at home. Secondly is the, the boys, they didn't want the old video stills done up by Kiwa. They wanted graphic novella, blood guts, give me fighting war stuff. So illustrations, you know, and again, because there was a lot of adults driving the process, we completely missed the boat in many ways. So we did a redo of everything and now everybody's happy, but what was the big message for us? Talk to the audience about digital. Don't talk to the adults. They'll get it wrong. Best intentions, but get it wrong. Um, another little example, this time a famous story, Kawiti, which is uh, from Nahit Natihini, way up in the far north. This was um, one of the chiefs that decided he didn't want to sign the treaty on February the 2nd, 
he decided he'd do it later on in May after negotiating, but he signed in the end, hooked up with Honeheke, who I'm a direct senator of, and chopped the flagpole down. So how does that go? So this was a, a, a more of a repurposed book version of what we can do with language. Kia kakati te namu, he matāra na kawiti, nā waihoro i hōtere nei tuhi, nā choi peka ngā pikitia. He poto te fiu a te ruki kawiti ki a hōpihana i waitangi i te rima o pēkuere tahimano warurau. E hoki, he hapau ni kone. So again, just giving you examples of different ways to repurpose work. Can't miss out Tainui, and this time we did a story on Pōkai, which is essentially um, a celebration, a hui that's run uh, regularly with the, the Tainui people. But again, we figured out, let's talk through the voice of the female okay. and the child. E haere ana koe kifia, e nana. E haere ana ki te Pōkai. Te Pōkai, nana. He aha tēnā, e nana. Hea ha te pōkai. E noho mai nei e moko. Māku e whakamārama ki au koi. Māku māku u. So you can see the technology working there where you've got swiping to read, touch to hear one word and then the spelling. Very important for literacy. Last but not least, um, moving back up to the United Arab Emirates where their own language is in really big problems right now. So Rhonda Kite, our founder, is living up there in Dubai, trying to help resolve that with the government. And here's an example of a uh, Emirati's child, and first in English, and then chopping into his own dialect, which he's only just learnt through SLAM. So enjoy. <laughs> While playing, he became very thirsty. He walked up the mountain where he saw a little bit of water at the top. بينما كان يلعب شعر بالعطش الشديد بدا بتسلق الجبل فوجد القليل من الماء على قمتها. The technology to do that is phenomenal. So it's easy going um, left to right and having characters like we do in English. As soon as we got into the Emirati's language where it's all cursive and linked together, incredibly difficult from a software point of view, but we cracked it. So to wrap up, um, we asked our partners around the world, what do you think, what, what are we doing? And this is what they said. From a keyword perspective, going back to our original chart of 7,000 languages, we think there's sort of five key steps to actually really revitalise using technology. And they're simplistic, but the devil's in the details. So it's identifying, so what language are you actually trying to resurrect? Collaborating, who's going to be involved in doing this? Because this is really hard, this is not easy. And then recording, we're going to we'll get the writing, we're going to get the audio, we're going to get the illustrations, and hopefully a little bit of video. Who's going to do that? Finally, work with someone professionally. The key was of the world that can actually make this happen for you in a digital app format, and then share with the world. That's me, over and out from Kiwa Digital. Kia ora. Thank you very much for listening. I was wondering if you could tell us um, a little bit about how like profit and money sharing works. You didn't mention it, but I assume things are charged for. Yes, we are a commercial entity. Um, simple version of this is there's two ways that we make money. One is to charge out a production fee. So we're going to repurpose a book or run a slam workshop for a fee. What are those numbers? I can divulge a bit of it. At a, at a basic sort of eight to 12 page children's book, in uh, two languages, you're looking at about $7,500 to create that book. That would be what I would, we would charge the author. Slams, d working with, say, 20 children, you're going to be somewhere in the vicinity of as low as maybe eight or 9000 and you can quickly scale up to twenty five, depending on how far they want to go with it and how many languages are, that are involved. The big thing when you're building an, a digital audio app book, in terms of cost, is the audio. 
So you can write the script down, that's easy. It's actually going into a proper sound studio or at least recording it on a personal device that gives you high quality so that when you synchronise the text and the sound, it's absolutely perfect. The last way that we can commercialise is through apps themselves. So you get on the other 2.5 million apps that are up on the iTunes store and your average price is going to be about $2.99. If you push it up, you might be around $6.99. If you jump into the iBook store, difference between iTunes and iBooks, essentially less text, more text. Once you jump into the iBook store, you can move up around $9.99 as an average price. So for every app that's sold, Apple would take 30% of whatever the price is, and we would take part of the balance that's left depending on what the author does or doesn't want to do. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. No, we're also with uh, Google, Android. You, you've got to be with Android. Um, difficult from a software point of view because it's open source code. So we love working with iOS because it's a contained ecosystem. The experience is very good. Microsoft have put their hand up now, and so they want to also have apps available. Hopefully, Microsoft 10, is they're saying that you can run iOS and Android apps in that system. Yay! <laughs> it means three more developers we don't have to employ. So good on you, Microsoft. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, just here. Uh, with, um, as you know, um, a lot of indigenous cultures have sort of secret knowledge. I'm interested to uh, ask if any indigenous cultures around the world have commissioned you to make talking books around the secret knowledge for their sort of inner circles so they can, you know, keep a hold of that sort of myth and symbol. You know. Naitahu are kind of doing that now. Um, it's kind of funny though, I mean this is me being a little bit cynical but also I've lived around the world for most of my life. There are no secrets. The moment the internet arrived it was like a detonated nuclear bomb around the idea of secrets. So whatever you think secrets, think FBI. We can crack into the FBI tomorrow. So the internet's changed the whole concept of secrets. The, some of the older generation is still getting the head around, oh no, that's secret, we can't reveal it. Listen, it's been revealed before you know it. In fact, the better way to do it is less secrets and focus more on how do you use the information. Because information is just information until you know actually how to use it. But no, exactly to your point, have we been commissioned to do the secret knowledge? Not yet, but stay posted. All right, that's uh, just time for Arvo T. So thank you again, Stephen. Thank you very much. Sure. That um, t Twitter address there, if you jump onto Twitter, um, I'll send you all sorts of super cool free links and free apps. So, Renata says, that's you. Thanks.